what I'm going to talk about today is um, what has happened as we've moved uh, through the um, intelligent interface world and where we need to move from here. We've been working on direct manipulation um, as a way of making more uh, um, recognizably simple interfaces for decades. Um, and the real issue that's changed is that whereas making an efficient interface was a great idea 10 years ago, today uh, the most important problem isn't, um, isn't whether it's uh, efficient, but whether it's effective. Whether we are uh, going to be motivated to use it, because at any moment we are either uh, in a veil of a social circumstance or we can jump to another place on the computer and do a million things, re regardless of what our boss tells us to do. Um, and as well as the graphical user interface issues of being uh, more, uh, better, uh, being uh, um, effect, uh, efficient, uh, uh, effective, uh, we have to think about um, the, the goal itself of efficiency. Um, as we think about efficiency, we have to really think about the fact that the stickiness is more interesting than, uh, than even um, the, <coughs> the slipperiness. And so as we've been trying to make computers more useful, uh, more, more part of our lives, uh, we've really found ourselves trying to understand, recognize the situation, um, and work within the context of that situation. I ran a group called Context Aware Computing for a decade uh, when people weren't so sure that they could actually recognize context. Now, now we think we can, but the problem is when we use reasoning systems and learning systems to understand the communication pattern that's going on between a person and a computer or the goals and tasks that a person are doing, we are still um, in a situation where the person has to um, decide that that's what they want to be doing. And <clears throat> what I started discovering uh, along this route was um, that um, in, in, in my systems, my context-aware systems, actually what was more important than anything was if the system didn't distract, disrupt, disorganize a person, and if a person wanted to use it. And so uh, just a simple thing, we had a, um, a user interface that would comment on the kind of text you're using, not about swearing, but uh, you know, the anger and surprise and frustration in your emails. And when it um, put up a, uh, some words saying, you know, surprised, angry, uh, what, uh, um, you know, upset, um, people didn't pay attention. When we put up a face that showed those emotions, people changed their writing. Okay? When we made a car that would tell you every time you forgot to blink, the press loved it. But when we made that car tell uh, all of the problems you were driving and all of the positive things you were driving, you drove worse. When we had it only tell you the positive things, driving smoothly, good braking, smooth steering, people drove worse. And when we said negative things only, they drove worse. When did they drive better with the system? When we used a variable schedule of reinforcement and were very careful to make sure that there was a lot of positive feedback, but that we didn't talk to people when they were cognitively loaded. How do you, how do you know that? Well, you know, if they're doing three things at once, that's a good time not to say something. If you have two or three things to say at once, maybe that's a good place to time not to do it. So now I'm really faced with the interesting thing that may be more exciting to me for a while, for now, is a layer that would be about when to communicate and why to communicate, to keep from disrupting and to keep people engaged. And so this, this layer that I uh, have been working on, uh, I call considerate systems. And um, just as an example, we made a system uh, a few years ago called Disruption Manager, just published um, at uh, Interact last summer, um, in which we were able to get 30% performance improvement for people taking orders uh, while they were taking IMs, emails, and, uh, and playing with their, e uh, their, their uh, web and some stuff like this. This is kind of amazing. Taking into account the topic, uh, um, you know, low-level things like what they're typing and mouse movements, and high-level things by the, like the relevance between things, we were able to dis reorganize uh, the actions a little bit. So <clears throat> as, we, as we're trying to understand if we really are going to be effective at making that social layer, 
the feedback, the social feedback. Should you be speaking now? What is going on? Um, the, you, you can choose between a variety of, of domains. If you think about um, communicating uh, in a feed-forward way, that's, that's this considerate person we call the hostess. Every time somebody comes into the restaurant or the party, uh, that person says, welcome, good to see you, you look great. You look marvelous. And, and no matter what they say, whatever what happens, they make them keep the people feel welcomed. Now, it would be feedback if one of them looks kind of pale and, and the person says, um, do you need to sit down? That isn't as, as, off, as common, actually, right? We, we run into that. That's, that's, that's social feedback with, uh, that's considerate feedback with feedback. All of the scenarios we're going to work on today have feedback. We are going to take into account the signal from the person that's working uh, as part of it. But we're going to start off in a difficult scenario purposefully to demonstrate that it is, that it is a generalized, domain-independent approach to, uh, to, to adding this layer of considerateness that we're able to get. We start off with audio between people not between a computer and a, a system. So now there is no way, unless we're doing um, uh, uh, a lot of speech reco and, and uh, summarization and, then, and, <laughs> and stuff, which, which of course is coming along but not great, um, to, to, to facilitate. What we are instead doing is listening to, to other, other issues about the phone call and deciding how to help with the phone call. Why audio? Audio is an exciting domain. Uh, for, for a lot of reasons. One is it's a broadcast medium. It's kind of a mess that way. And in fact, if you have a conference call, it's an overloaded channel. There, everybody could talk at once, and they still would, yes. you know, they, you know anyway. It, and, and you know, you would get nowhere. So how do we make a conference call better? Um, and with, with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Raul, who's going to tell you about uh, the Cameo system um, that um, does considerate audio mediation. Uh, to, to uh, improve conference calls and other audio um, kinds of communication. Thanks, Ted. Um, I want to begin my part of the talk with a quote yeah. from uh, Martha Pollock, where she says, uh, we want to build intelligent actors, not just intelligent thinkers. And uh, I want to use this to frame the, the rest of the talk, because there's normally three parts to building an AI system. There's a sensing, there's a reasoning, and there's the action, but not a lot of focus on the action. So in this talk, I want to I want to frame frame the rest of the talk with this uh, with this focus. Um, so I'm going to start with uh, talking about um, intelligent actors and how they're becoming um, a reality in our lives because we no no longer use these just to crunch numbers, but uh, you know they're encroaching in all our social spaces from uh, smart cars, uh, mediated communications, and personal agents like Siri. Now, Clifford Nash. Uh, here at Stanford has shown that you know, we treat these intelligent actors as social actors. Uh, we expect them um, to, to adhere to the same social rules that we hold each other to. Um, and indeed, there's been commercial ex examples of this. Uh, Clippy, uh, which is one of the first uh, intelligent systems uh, to be commercially available, um, was not very popular. But Siri, on the other hand, is relatively more popular because uh, it, it fails more gracefully. And so this, this notion of uh, social actors and social interfaces is not new. And there's been a lot of research, um, especially in these two areas, um, social signal processing and uh, uh, effective computing. Is his microphone now, on? Social signal pro so in this picture, you have a couple, and, and it looks like they're in the middle of a fight. right? And there's a lot of social signals just from that picture, the gaze, you know, the, the distance between them. And processing that social signal and recognizing this is called social signal processing. And being able to respond to that is, uh, is what we call effect. Is it not on? I think you might uh, it, yeah, it Can you just rub your, rub your mic? Oh, yeah, it's working. Okay. Cool. Uh, responding to this so as to simulate empathy is what, uh, what effective computing is. And, and, and this is very social, very at, the, at the very surface level. Like you can see using emoticons, uh, mobile phones that change their display based on their mood, uh, conversational agents, and you, know, you, you even have uh, personal robots now. So the next step is to build socially intelligent systems, not just at the surface level, but they're able to make social decisions based on 
uh, you know, more sophisticated reasoning. So if I were to enter a room where a couple is in the middle of a fight, you know, I would modulate my actions, right? I might not interrupt them, leave the room, do various things. And that, that's what I mean by the social reasoning, right? Um, OK, so basically this side is telling us that social reasoning and social intelligence is pretty, pretty complicated. And uh, what we want to do as a first step in building considered systems is just focus on the action part, right? So um, assuming certain things on the sensing, I'm, make, I'm making a, a number of simplifications. But I'm focusing on the action part. And in particular, I'm focusing on two actions, advisory and assistive. So here's a formal definition for considered systems. Uh, systems that display an awareness of the state of the user and the situated social context by behaving in ways that support human-human and human-machine interactions. That is, behaving appropriately. And that's really the soul of what we mean by considered systems. Now, the scientific definition, there's a lot of parts to it. It's our whole big agenda. Uh, but in this talk, I'm going to focus on this um, particular point, parametrizing of the actions. right? So I want to support interactions uh, by providing some feedback. And the question is, how am I going to parameterize this action? Uh, so we built an exemplar system that we call Cameo. Uh, we chose the teleconference domain because a uh, number of reasons. First, it's very popular, but it has pretty low satisfactory ratings. As you can see here, compared to face-to-face -face meeting, web conferences, etc. Also, it's a very well-studied domain. So the problems are very well defined, like in this uh, compilation by Yankulovic, who surveyed uh, participants after a number of meetings. Um, he basically grouped the problems into three categories, behavioral, audio, and technical. And uh, we're going to focus on, uh, uh, on, on, on four of these problems, because they represent a large percentage. Um, but what's interesting here is that Yanklovic says that you see how the audio problems are, have, have a lot of complaints, and they're technical. But he says these problems are actually social because of the, of the uh, social pressure people have against you know, breaking the conversation and pointing out a problem. So if one of you were to interrupt me and say, hey, I can't hear you, it's, it's an interruption. And there's a social pressure against doing that. Um, so this brings us to our problem statement. Um, can we use a considered agent to improve distributed communications using advisory and assistive actions? So I'll, I'll get into what I mean by advisory and assistive actions. Um, well, let me first give you a cybernetics perspective. This is a normal conference call. You have the conference call. You have the participants talking. And we want to add an agent, which we call Cameo, considered audio mediating oracle. And we give Cameo two actions. Assistive and advisory. Assistive when it's directly influencing the channel. So it's uh, muting somebody, putting reverb on the channel. That's assistive. It's directly influencing the channel. Advisory is when it's saying something to the participants. Hey, maybe you can do this better. Right? It's giving some advice to the participants and hoping that the participants affect some change in the conference call. Um, so before I jump into Cameo, I'm going to briefly go over some of the related work. Uh, and how people have tackled this problem. One very popular interface is the Loops Babel interface from IBM. And basically, they came up with this social translucent framework. And uh, what they're saying is that if you increase visibility, you give rise to awareness, which in turn gives rise to accountability. And they explain it with this uh, story, which I'll, I'll narrate. Uh, imagine you have a door that opens from a hallway into a, a stairway. Now, uh, if you open the door fast, you're likely to hit into someone trying to come in the other way. And you can, can imagine trying to solve this problem by putting a sign on the door that says, uh, please open carefully. Uh, but it doesn't work that well, as, as you, you, you probably have experienced. Uh, a better solution would be to put a glass door, uh, a glass window in the door. And now you have, you're creating this visibility, and thus awareness, and thus accountability. And that's what their story is. Another group at MIT uh, built a meeting mediator, which is basically you have this device that participants wear, uh, and that's measuring you know, how much you're talking, uh, et cetera. And everyone gets to see a visualization. So you have, say, four participants, and each of them has a mobile phone which, with this visualization on the phone. The four corners indicate uh, the four participants in the meeting. 
Um, this, the, the circle indicates the balance in the meeting, right? And the color indicates the level of interactivity. So in this window on the left, you have a very balanced meeting, right? People are talking equally, participating. On the right, you have participant Y who's dominating the meeting. And what they showed is that providing this kind of feedback can uh, change behavior. Now, what we are wondering is if we can provide proactive actions, because these have been shown to be even more successful at getting users to change their behavior. And let me compare those related works to a common social problem of speeding. Right, so we can compare the social translucence to our political and uh, not political, police and judicial system. Right? And that, that gives rise to accountability. The passive feedback is like the speedometer, where you, you know how fast you're going, and thus you modulate your actions. And the proactive actions, which have been shown to be most successful, is, is, the, is, the, speed, uh, is the radar gun sh flashing your speed. Right, so, and these are, this has been shown to be most successful in getting people to slow down. So the question is, can we use this insight um, when building Cameo? OK. So I'm going to focus on uh, five features which are drawn from that problem set I uh, brought up before. The first two, dominance, dormancy, extraneous noise, I'm going to try to tackle with advisory actions. The last three, speaker identification, participant presence, entry exit notification, I'm going to try and tackle with assistive actions. Um, a quick look at the architecture. Um, basically, I have participants rem collaborating remotely. Um, each participant gets their own uh, Blackboard architecture, which is this conflict resolution mechanism. Right? So each participant gets a channelizer, which is monitoring them, keeping track of you know, whether they're speaking or not, how loudly they're speaking, what's the background noise on their channel. And similarly, there's a Blackboard for the whole meeting, the globalizer. Right, that's keeping track of all the participants. Has someone entered or left the meeting? Is someone being dominant? Right? And basically, very, um, things get populated into the priority queue and finally get pushed into the text-to-speech module, which is the main actuator for Cameo. So we built this system, and we started playing with it. It became immediately apparent that it's very difficult to introduce actions into an, into an already overloaded communication channel. So imagine you have five people talking, and then you have this agent trying to say something. It's very difficult uh, to get it right. Uh, and it's very easy to disrupt the communication to get uh, participants annoyed. And so one of the, one of the big takeaways for me, and, and something I want to share here, is that any action has two components to it. You're communicating information but you're also negotiating a relationship type. So it's it, back to that old adage, it's not, uh, it's not what you say, it's how you say, right? So am I trying to dominate you? Am I trying to command you? Am I trying to be friendly, right? And other things we want to keep in mind is that we want to be perceived by the user as pertinent and thoughtful and not distracting, condescending, or hostile. OK, so the first problem that we want to tackle from this list is the, uh, the meeting was not well facilitated. People talking too much, too little. It was shown to be um, the numbers on the right. Let me explain that. 6% is the number of people who were surveyed who found that to be a problem. And a p-value of uh, 0 .00 uh, indicates that this problem was highly impacted meeting effectiveness. So. Um, quite a significant problem. Now the question is, how do we design uh, these, these prompts, these actions, right? We, have, we want to make an advisory action. And the question is, how do we, how do we um, design it? And uh, so do we make, uh, I just want to contrast two, two types of actions for you. Uh, there's a long, Right, it's long, it's commanding. Imagine hearing that a couple of times when you're talking to other people. Uh, as a compared to, I'll play that again. Short, suggestive, right? Similarly for dormant. Right. Uh, as opposed to. So, um, now, now you're wondering. Okay, so. Did we, were we able to get anything with this action? Right? And so I'm going to talk about the experiment we designed 
Um, what we found out was that uh, research has shown that particular types of meetings, especially brainstorming meetings, work better when everyone's talking more equally, right? So you have constructive, in, uh, if you can get constructive interaction styles, you get better performance. On the flip side, when there's uh, varying dominance, when someone's talking a lot, someone's not talking enough, you get passive, in, in, uh, passive and defensive interaction styles, which is what we don't want. Right? And our hypothesis is that using advisory actions, we can decrease this, this variance in dominance. So what we did was we got uh, 12 groups of uh, three participants. We had them collaborating remotely on hangman puzzles. And uh, basically, they had to follow a protocol where everyone agrees on, on a letter. And the last person to agree on the letter uh, puts the letter in. And so we have um, right, different rooms. The only video they see is this, the, the hangman screen and just collaborating. Um, we had this. We had in group, in, uh, in um, intra-group studies. So the same people doing this, um, doing the doing the uh, experiment with Cameo and without Cameo. And what we found was that um, without Cameo, uh, there is a large variance in uh, in dominance. So without Cameo, is this red line. These are the dominance levels of the different participants. This is the dominance levels, that's, that's the participants. I'm just plotting the dominance levels of the participants. And you can see that without Cameo uh, mediating, there's a large variance in, 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 in the uh, participation levels. What happens is someone starts talking, and the other people just let him keep going. Right? And, and the dominant people remain dominant. Uh, contrast this with the blue curve, where you have people where, where you can see the variance is a lot short. We're talking almost almost half the variance. And that's a very powerful statement to make with just the two utterances that I made you hear previously. Uh, so we can conclude that Cameo's advisory actions reduced uh, variance in, in, in the dominance levels. And what's even more surprising here is that people said that they didn't, they didn't notice uh, the prompts. It's kind of scary, because <laughs> that means that nothing would show up in the data, but the data uh, was different. It's quite surprising. OK, um, so the next problem we wanted to focus on was too much extraneous noise. Um, again, a problem that 20% of the people uh, felt very significantly uh, uh, attacked, uh, impacted uh, meeting effectiveness. Okay. So again, how do you design this? Uh, there's a pressure to not disrupt the meeting, right? There's a social pressure people feel, I don't, want to, I don't want to disrupt the meeting and say, hey, can you turn that volume down, right? And this is where we felt Cameo could take the role of the bad guy, right? Cameo can be more persistent, especially it's, it's a private notification. Only, only the offending party gets to hear it. So the commu communication goes on as normal. Only you hear it in your channel. And, and we have, uh, let me just make you hear it. It's a very short, and short notification, that's all. Right, just noisy. In the background, there's a television making noise. Right. So how do we evaluate this? Um, sorry. How do you evaluate this? Um, we wanted to simulate a problem-solving session, right, high cognitive load. Uh, what we had the participants do is um, tackle um, a chess problem, a made in three uh, chess puzzle. And uh, same scenario, they're sitting in different rooms, collaborating on the mic. Uh, but much more involved and deep discussion, right? Because you have to think three levels into the problem. And so in, in the rooms of one of the participants, like Ted said, we had a TV. And we would incrementally increase the volume of the TV. And we would give the, um, the participant had the remote control. And we said, see, if anyone on the line or if Cameo prompts you, then reduce the volume. Right? So, um, and, what, and what we found was that um, again, the same thing. Like it's the same group with Cameo mediating and without Cameo mediating. And we, were, and we found that is that um, when the TV volume increased, someone on the line would say, hey, that's loud. Can you turn that down? Right? But uh, the person would do it. Then a couple of minutes into the meeting, we would turn the volume back up again. But this time, no one said anything. Instead, what they did was they just started talking louder. And what happened as they started talking loud, you could feel it. You could feel it in the room. The, the temperature of the room increased. They started getting more aggressive uh, about, about their position because you know, they're all arguing about which, which move to make. And this was reflected in the data. Uh, with, with Cameo uh, 
mediating, there are only seven interrupts in a four meeting, four minute meeting as opposed to 12 and a half without Cameo mediating. Uh, by interrupts, interrupts I mean uh, I'm talking and somebody else talks over me and cuts me off. So that's, an that's what we count as an interrupt. Uh, as you can see, just with, that, just with that notification noisy, we're able to cut down the uh, number of interrupts um, uh, by half. And, and you know, as witnessing all this, you can see that the interaction was the same people, the same time frame. We're just doing Cameo mediating, and then they continue with Cameo not mediating. And this was balanced. Half the time, Cameo started, and the other half, Cameo started in the second part. So again, concluding that Cameo's advisory action was able to uh, reduce the impact. Uh, the third problem. Uh, was that it's difficult to identify who's speaking. Um, OK, so I'm just going to play a qu quick sample of. What is it? Right, so this is. This is five people trying to talk together to make a decision. And you're trying to identify who's speaking. Um, they're all non-native uh, English, English speakers. speakers. Yeah. So it, it can become very hard to tell who's speaking. Um, and so to tackle this problem, we, we thought of introducing ear cons. That is, so when I start speaking, a music track starts playing. Uh, so that's more easier to identify me. Uh, initially, we started with the instrumental tracks. So I'm bass, and someone else is drums. And, it becomes very hard to focus on the conversation because this there's a lot of crosstalk. Uh, so instead of that, instead of playing tracks, full tracks, we thought we might use tonal pulses. So just these tones that are pulsing every time you make an utterance. We started off with using the same timbre, uh, but varying the pitch, right, different notes of a chord. Uh, but again, it becomes very difficult to distinguish between the different notes. What we ended up doing was using different timbers. Um, uh, and I'll make you hear that. So the different timbers are uh, tambourine, um, uh, 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 muted electric bass, uh, uh, bongo, uh, and a vibraphone. So as you can see, as you hear, uh, the different tones, it becomes much easier to uh, yeah. distinguish between. Yes. Did you find a limit on the number of these that could be workable? Uh, that, that comes up in an next experiment where we kind of identified one to and many people not getting to say anything. And you'll see that in a few minutes. OK, so we also um, added uh, spatial cues. We said, OK, no cues is the baseline. Spatial cues is, is the gold standard, right? If I uh, place the speakers on, um, in, in, in different, on different uh, um, degrees on the stereo panning, um, that's going to be the gold standard. So we compared all three. Um, uh, in an experiment, so we had we had people listen to this uh, conference call, five people collaborating. We added these uh, cues, these assistive audio cues, because our hypothesis is that these audio cues can help uh, participants and distinguish between speakers much easier. Uh, we had 32 participants listening to this and answering questions related to who suggested that chocolate was a good idea, right? So answering questions of that nature. And what we found was that um, with the ear cons and the spatial, the spatial, the ear cons and spatial pretty much did equally well. They did much better than having no audio cues, right? Um, this is the accuracy. So the, the ear cons are those little timber sounds you said. The you see better accuracy and reduced uh, response time in both the spatial and in these little, little, little added noises. Right. And comparable to the gold standard, which we said. Uh, is placing the, the speakers spatially. So we were able to show that Cameo's, this particular assistive action to identify speakers by adding audio cues on the channel um, helped others to distinguish between the speakers. Um, 
Uh, finally, there's uh, this problem, not able to tell who was in the meeting, who joined, who left. And uh, we have two experiments uh, that I'll talk about. The first part, not tell who was in the meeting, participant presence. Now, um, um, our initial idea was to build a soundscape. So uh, you know, there's five people in the room. There's going to be five instruments. Um, and you, you hear the soundscape in the background, so you know that people are there, even though they're not talking. And if, and if you hear a particular instrument drop off, then you realize that someone dropped off the line. All right. And um, again, we tried the instrumental, instrumental first. Um, what you're hearing, the bongos, shakers, and strings. Because maybe you can gather some grass or some woods by itself. It's a, and as you can hear, it's, it's a very strong presence on the audio line. It can be a little distracting, so we tried to tone it down a bit uh, by using nature sounds instead. So what you're hearing are birds, crickets, the sound of ocean, water. But it still has a bit of a Load, load on top of right. The it's and it's it's a, it's a particularly it's it, it gets interesting because uh, uh, it's difficult to uh, pretty uh, notice when something is dropped off. So we decided to try the uh, roll call method. Where okay, so you're having this conference call. Someone hasn't talked in a while, so we make keyboard noises uh, or uh, or you know opening and closing the drawer just to show that these guys still present, he's on the line, he's just, he hasn't talked in a while, right? Um, and uh, what, what we found was it's hard to, it gets hard to uh, 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 map these sounds to particular users, so we were using dynamic uh, mapping, so uh, every time someone became quiet, we would dynamically assign an instrument, so, uh, uh, yeah, oh yeah. So what you'll hear is the sound of Keyboard. And the and the sound of a dryer opening and closing. Right. Okay. So you're probably wondering the same thing I was when I designed this. And I was like, is it really going to help? Right. Uh, and so we designed an experiment. Uh, same thing again, people are listening to this uh, conference call, we add these cues. And, and what, we, what we told them was, look, this, these guys were in a, in a you know, low signal quality area, and there was a high likelihood that some of them drop off because they're moving here and there. Um, and it's your job to make sure that everyone's online. Right? So uh, we give them a nudge button, which gives them feedback that everyone's present. And it was their job to periodically nudge to make sure that everyone was online. And we're wondering, what's the difference in these two scenarios? So we had uh, a between group study where some people listen to the uh, uh, conference call with cues, and some people listen to it without the cues. And we were surprised to find that um, with the cues, people made 3.5 uh, nudges on average. Uh, and without the cues, they were nudging um, a lot more, and this is in a in a four minute conference call. So it did make a difference, and uh, uh, right. So um, they notice. Ah, so again, it's you. You talk to the participants after the after the experiment, and it's it's. It's 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 uncanny. They don't they don't notice it. They don't really. Uh, did you hear the keyboard sounds? Uh, no, I don't think I did. Which is which is which is the surprising part because we are getting results that saying that uh, you know some sort of impact is happening. It might be happening at subconscious level. I don't know, but something is happening, and we are able to see it. Although the participants themselves don't notice it, which is a good thing because you don't want to be intruding on the conference call, and that's the whole point here to be considerate. Okay, so finally. Uh, we wanted to use, uh, explore different types of entry and exit mechanisms because, you know, current systems they use they have this big speech prompt which is annoying if you hear. 
uh, if sitting and, and you know people coming in and going out, it gets annoying because you start talking and then suddenly you get this prompt. So we're wondering what are the other kinds of things we can do to announce entry and exit. Um, we started with iconic prompts, which is the sound of a door, using the sound of a door to indicate entry <coughs> and exit. So here's entrance, John. door opening, and the name, uh, exit. John. The, the name and the door closing. Uh, we did this different sequencing because Parsman said that it was hard to differentiate between uh, door opening and door closing. So if I, yeah. so are, are all of your experiments four to five people? Um, yeah. Nothing like say thirty. In the no, conference no. calls, yes. There, there were several thirty-seven in that in that uh, dominance one earlier. The evaluations have a lot of people evaluating it, but the conference calls themselves are. Small, smaller conference calls. And these, these are all the, 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 the results that we're uh, stating uh, where we found a result. We have statistical significance at the at the ninety-five percent. Uh, right no, a more a matter of just trying to s distinguish voices. Yeah. I mean, when you have thirty people, that's so much harder. <sighs> yes. Well. But thirty people are not going to be speaking at the same time. No, no. He's in conference calls where there's a hundred people. <laughs> yeah. I had a I had a thirty-person one earlier today. Okay. And in fact. You're, you're going to be raising some questions. There was another Stanford funder, Technicolor Research Lab, had a discussion today. It was audio based as well, too, but there are more questions on privacy and how you guys are going to address that. But I'll save that toward the end. Okay. I have a point to make about large. It might be interesting to use these cues to indicate uh, role. Are you a designer or engineer? Are you affiliated with Stanford or with CMU? I mean, just giving some sort of background about the speaker might also be useful if you can't give the full identity. But that would be beyond what we've done to this moment. Right. Um, and finally, we um, also tried metaphoric prompts uh, using fade and intonation. So let's quickly play that. John. So that's entry with the normal intonation. And for exit, we use the upward intonation. So again, we're wondering if. Doing these designs, does anything does it matter? Does anything come out of it? And uh, so we designed an experiment where we had uh, people randomly dropped off the call uh, and collaborating. And basically, they were collaborating on a on a memory game. So um, cards would pop up on the screen. They would select a card, would turn face over, and they would have to remember it uh, to select a similar car, card. Card. Uh, the next time their turn came, and uh, so what we were doing was uh, we had six groups of four participants. Each group went through three of the prompts. So each group experienced three of the prompts. And uh, what we found was that, um, so we actually had a protocol. Let me quickly tell you about that. So, this is, so there's four people uh, collaborating in two teams, right? So me and my partner, another team uh, uh, with two partners. And the way it works is I pick a card. And my partner doesn't see which card I picked. I have to explain the card to them, and then they pick their card, all in a distributed collaboration. Now, the protocol was that uh, my partner and I alternate uh, who picks the first card. So if this turn, I pick the first card. The next turn, my partner picks the, picks the first card. And what we found was that with the metaphoric prompts, which is this is the intonation, using just the upward and downward intonation, people made a lot fewer errors in, in that protocol. Uh, as compared to the iconic and the speech, people are making a lot more errors, again, with the statistical significance. Uh, and that's interesting. So what's interesting is that initially, people were uh, preferred the speech prompt to the metaphoric prompts and the iconic prompts. But after they got familiar with the metaphoric, once they understood the metaphor, they preferred that because it was shorter and to the point. But what's more interesting is that it's actually impacting you know, the cognitive ability of the, of, the, of, of the participants here in that they're making fewer errors. Uh, in this case, errors in the following the protocol. OK, so I ran through five experiments. The first two uh, we showed we can attack using the advisory actions. Uh, and this last three, we, we tackle using the assistive actions. Uh, to conclude, um, intelligent actors are social actors. Um, and they need to have some semblance of social intelligence. 
Intelligence requires you to be able to sense, reason, and act. In this talk, we're focusing on action. And in particular, considered systems uh, is focusing on supporting interactions using advisory and assistive actions. We built an exemplar system, uh, which we call Cameo. Uh, and we demonstrated that we can uh, advisory actions work uh, best with nudge-like phrases, and assistive actions have to be synchronous with the interaction. Um, so just to bring up uh, discussion, we were talking about how an agent makes actions, right? So you have advisory and assistive. What really comes out of it is that there's a, there's a syntax and semantics for this considered feedback language. And the next question is, when do you make these actions? Do it, so we could pull from cognitive psychology, uh, where they have different forms of reinforcement feedback, and, and think about you know, when uh, an, an agent makes an action. So someone's being dominant. Uh, you, know, you can have different levels of, of uh, actions. One is you just advise them. Another one is you, the most extreme. It could be you just mute them. Right? So when do you choose which action, and at what scale? And degree, and 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 finally, just to connect the dots, uh, we were looking at action, but then we also need to uh, integrate with you know other communities doing sensing, social signal processing, and the reasoning. Uh, and with that, I'll hand it over to Ted. So you can see we we've had surprising success. I mean, the reason I call it surprising actually is because we found dozens of ways of making these conference calls much worse. Uh, almost everything we did, adding sound, uh, made them worse. And it took us a couple of years, actually, before we ended up having these, these, these things that look so simple today. Um, the, the papers that uh, represent this are at uh, CHI 2012. Um, there's one. And also there's another paper at uh, um, Design Interaction and Systems. Designing that? Interactive Systems. Designing Interactive Systems. Um, last summer, uh, it's a, um, a great conference, by the way. Um, and then there's another one we've submitted to CHI for this year, uh, uh, Interact um, uh, 2013. Um, so those are, those are places where you can find out more about it, to just to look online. Um, the really, the, the most uh, um, uh, important thing to realize is, you know, we've, we've only gotten started. We've been taking a look just at the human-human communication. Um, human, you know, computer interactions changing now. It's going to be human system interaction. Of course, the system can have people and, and computers and telephones and everything else. And as we move forward, you know, what, what are we going to take from this? We're building, Chihiro uh, Suga is working with us on, a uh, new, new PhD student this week, by the way, um, is, is, uh, we're working on the supervisor level. You saw a little bit of that architecture, in which we're going to make these domain independent systems that are going to be all about understanding when uh, and how to, to um, respond socially. And we're going to be trying them uh, in meeting support, uh, in, in computer, um, computer operating system support. We're going to be trying them in telephone support. Uh, we've been working, as, as you know, in, 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 uh, in the past in, in, in cars and kitchens, um, as you can see from other talks I've given here. And we'd be delighted to work in that kind of domains as well. But um, today, uh, some of our funding even comes from people that are interested in how, how to make uh, televisions more socially appropriate. So I just really uh, thank you guys all for coming here. And we're excited to be uh, hopefully introducing people to, to the thought that social feedback is going to be crucial as a, as a field of research and as um, a technology that can actually be layered on top of or integrated into uh, the intelligent user interfaces that we build in the future. So thank you very much. Okay. Anybody want to ask some questions? Yes. yes. Either of us? When, when, okay. We'll go, we'll go first. So this is uh, uh, audio is, is the main uh, channel. That we've been using uh, these experiments, yeah. yes. Uh, but the usual, usual reason people are using audio without visual is, is to conserve bandwidth. Um, have you thought of putting a display in there so you can, you can use visual we communications? Have, we, you know, when the first thing that happened when Raoul started getting on this project is, well, can't we put it in a display? Can't we? I said, not to begin with. Because the real, the real you know, of course multimodal interactions are great and interesting, but the question is whether we can succeed with a very small bandwidth and not 
and not changing the modality of the communication. So, in fact, it was an extra constriction that we put on ourselves, uh, a constraint, I guess, to, to make a more interesting problem and to be, to be better at knowing whether or not uh, the thing was being useful. Is there anything we want to add? Yeah, to I have another comment. I don't know if it's true that we use audio only to conserve bandwidth because there was a recent paper that showed that, especially in business meetings, um, audio is still the most prevalent. Uh, people prefer video for home and personal, especially because you become very self-conscious when there's a camera on you. Uh, so that that's not necessarily true that people are using video um, uh, audio only for bandwidth constructions. You had a question. Oh, um, Paul, this is this is cool stuff. A uh, couple different reactions. One was uh, the other restriction you put on yourselves was that the agent was acting uh, on its own without any assistance from, say, the moderator. And you can easily imagine considerably better effectiveness uh, if the moderator is somehow part of controlling the behavior. Another one is varying uh, uh, sort of what model you're applying. There's some meetings, it's very sensitive, I need to know who's joining as soon as they join because we want to make sure they're okay. Others, it's completely open. We actually don't want anyone to, to, to interrupt us. We want to just do the discussion right. uh, and, var and variations like that. So, so if you take a look at, you know, there's dissemination meetings. Everyone in my kingdom must obey. Uh, there, there are, there are uh, you know, meetings for bringing the team together. We, you know, we're celebrating Raul getting his PhD. Oops, that hasn't happened yet. Um, there, there are meetings where we're brainstorming, and there's meetings right. where there are problem solving. Those are at least four of... Uh, of the kinds of meetings that happen. And one could imagine by bringing the right model in, you could make big improvements. Well, one other thing, uh, you, you, I'm sure you know what you did, but you didn't say it quite this way. When you talked about longer versus shorter uh, uh, advice statements that you gave, uh, you also completely altered the, the judgment quality. Uh, the first was critical and, and almost passive. The second one just invoked a behavior issue. Right. Well, I think I did try to mention that one is more commanding and the other is uh, more suggestive. And in, in every action that you make, you have to realize that you're negotiating your social relationship there. Right. That, that's, that's, I think, exactly what you're, what you're bringing up. And so that's, uh, you know, those are all really important things. Another thing to point out about that, one of the, one of the funniest things, we went to sat in, uh, with Terry Winograd and, and Cliff Nass and told them about this work. And they said, oh, this is, this is so exciting. Why don't you make a company? I said, well, right now it's so exciting. Why don't we make a PhD? But um, the, the really, you know, the, the, there are different things. You, you sort of mentioning some. If you were to try to make this be part of a scenario that would be about making money, sure, you could bring in all sorts of things. Right now, we're just trying to understand um, the value of of, of these uh, of the social ability to understand and react socially. You've been trying to raise your hand for a while. Yeah. Um, does the system have any memory from meeting to meeting? Because if the same people show up, then you have the same behaviors and you can start retraining certain people earlier. And, so, and, you, and you know what they respond to. That's the other thing you get. Yeah. It's a fabulous idea. Um, you know, at this point, uh, <laughs> to, to, to Raoul's chagrin, we've spent our time understanding this very, very uh, surface level uh, uh, reaction. I mean, he started off taking, you know, machine learning and, and, and classification, a lot, you know, courses like that. And, and then we find ourselves backing, backing, backing off to just well, getting responses that, 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 that serve our purposes. The next moving, steps yeah. are very exciting when you start getting to those yeah. things you're talking yeah. about. Well, you know, you're moving to a different part of the brain. The hard part is the, uh, the chess is the easy problem. People are the hard, uh, uh, dealing with people is much harder. Right. So, so if you take a look at some of the other work where we have models, cognitive model of when and why mm -hmm. to, to react, those, you know, so far individual differences have not been part of the agenda. It's an interesting area. Um, in general, um, you know, universal design is, uh, Gets whatever it is, ninety percent, ten percent is the is the yeah. is the individual difference. Depends on the whole thing in terms of the, the model of what the, what the, what the meeting's about and, and so on. But yes, well, very the fact, interesting. The fact that meetings have a, a relatively small range of paradigms that they tend to fit within 
it, it gives you a transactional repertoire that most of the time people are familiar with, and they might forget, but they're familiar with it, and that gives you a, a, an awful lot of leverage. Yeah, I think I think that's an exciting point. So, how much difference is there in, in sort of opinions from individual to individual? I, about how it works? Yeah, I don't, I don't have an audio example, but but in terms of web pages, I get really pissed off at blinky bouncy crap. <laughs> right? And you know, people that uh, maybe it's just because I'm an old fart and haven't learned how to, you know, play games and crap. But right. I, uh, do you want to speak to that? I I think there is. I mean, it's like you said. It's um, I think it's it's how much you've been exposed to it. So the long prompt, the first time I show someone, I show that slide to someone, I make them hear both sides. I'm like, which one do you prefer? They're like, oh, I don't really care. But if you were in a meeting that, where that prompt kept coming, right, every five minutes you kept hearing that, it would annoy, really annoy you. And I think so uh, getting that kind of uh, opinions would be, I think would really matter if you could get it into long meetings where you keep hearing this sort of thing. I have even a stronger reaction to this. Um, a lot of the excitement for me is um, in that hangman example where you're filling out a word, you know, one word long, and it's you know a three, four minute task. We had these huge changes in performance when they had this this feedback. I we I, I think that the, these results are quite solid. I uh, the 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 you know he says it seems subtle to people when they're actually trying to succeed at something. The distraction level we. we when we first started with that one where we added the orchestra and you know we started having a whole when there's five people there's a whole you know five piece band playing oh my gosh <laughs> the people that we had helping us do the program we had some some students summer students they just started quitting they found other jobs it was so frustrating and annoying you couldn't believe it and it, i mean it, i i would say it took us almost a year before we started finding finding results that really were uh, anything but just really frustrating and uh, that, yeah so there's easy ways to go really bad are there, there, I see there's a few students here. Is there any student that wants to ask a question or say something? There, I mean, it seems like you'd imagine that that would be a time in the life that people would be really curious. And they have yeah. Youth wasted on the young. <laughs> <laughs> Youth wasted on the young. You don't appreciate it until you get old. Um, is, that, is that it or one more well, or less? Well, as a, as a non-student, there's one guy associated with 3A. He didn't show up today, Steve Zenith. Uh, I had a 16-hour drive up with him two falls ago to Seattle to a conference. And it, we, we were discussing about artificial intelligence. And we were talking, in fact, about considered computing. And one of the things that he pointed out is about two decades ago, he programmed automatic teller machines for banks. And one of the things that really irks him about uh, interactions and messages is Computers don't say please. You really, you know, it's like, is that all you need for artificial intelligence, Stephen? And he would say, yes, as a matter of fact, it is. And I, and I, and I would kind of urge you at some point in time, we, we should probably, as when I say we, I mean the 380 infrastructure should introduce you to him. Uh, Fantastic. To, too, to, get, to get some ideas. So when you use Firefox, which I'm told is, some, is an anachronism to some, um, and you and 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 the and the web browser breaks for one reason or another. It'll come back with, oh that, oh this is embarrassing. Should I restart all of your things? And that is what we call feed forward, uh, considerate behavior. In other words, it doesn't know what I'm thinking, what I'm saying. It just knows its situation. <laughs> and yet, just as you're saying that word, please helped. It's tremendous. I'm shocked every time it happens. I'm kind of delighted, and it surprises me that it delights me. Um, that yeah. just, just adding that little phrase. Oh, my reaction is so much more different than that. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, I think it crashes more than IE, and that's objectively not true. It pisses me off. The, the, the message? Yeah, because insti instead, instead of being polite, fix your damn browser. Well, the first, the first time it's okay, the second time I'm like, I'm doing cute, cute weird spin. Yeah. I, got, I got taught that a long time ago yeah. where um, the, the editor that we were using in, in the environment, people would use it then go into programming. This is a very long time ago. And the original programmer uh, had the text say, once more dear friends into the breach. And I took over the editor from the original author 
And within minutes of people hearing I had taken it over, they were lining up at my door saying, please take that text out. Of course. So is that the problem with the Microsoft paperclip? No, there's, there's a whole bunch of problems. One of the problems with the paperclip is that it does, uh, it, 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 it makes visual noise in your periphery. Your periphery has a very autonomic uh, tendency to, to drag the eye over there because it's the tiger that's coming after you. It's, 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 it's down on, in your hippocampus. The second thing about it is that it is taking your attention away from what you are doing to something else. The third problem that it has is that um, it is about what. It's not a how. So if you look at it, it, his it historically and typically tells you this, this is a text editor or something like that. It doesn't, it doesn't solve your problem. And so not being specific enough. And um, I can probably add some more. <coughs> But anyway, they made they made a few little mistakes. And they're very. I mean, what's funny is that <laughs> there were some serious cognitive scientists involved, and they made very simple cognitive uh, psychology mistakes. Uh, and 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 uh, you know. But the uh, biggest mistake was that they they you know shipped it. Yeah. Well, you know, it got it got yeah. I I I don't want to say too much. We more. have to turn off. The By the way, it, <laughs> you guys don't realize it, but OS two at that same time was shipping an an intelligent help system that decided how much and what help to give you and what time, and, and uh, I designed it, and it was really fabulous. But, but <laughs> of OS2, of course, was you know, having this terrible problem of not having any apps on it. That's a whole world. Um, I don't know if we're just babbling at this point. Is this probably enough for now?